Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission, from the Nebraska Library Commission. <laughs> um, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show, broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing this morning, and then it is posted to our archives for you to watch at your convenience. And I will show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our um, archive shows. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Um, well, we do a mixture of things here. For those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, similar, similar to your state library. So we provide services to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find um, topics and shows and um, sessions in our archives for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, um, museums, archives, corrections, et cetera. It goes anything and everything. Really, our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Um, uh, library, uh, book reviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, um, all sorts of things. We bring in, um, we do bring in guest speakers from um, around the state and around the country, but we also have our own Nebraska Library Commission staff that do come and uh, do some presentations for us, and that's what we have this morning. Um, Today is the last Wednesday of the month, so it is Pretty Sweet Tech Day. Yay! Um, uh, this is the <laughs> once a month session. Every um, The last Wednesday of the month, always, Amanda Sweet, our technology innovation librarian at the Nebraska Library Commission, comes on to talk to us about um, anything tech. -y. So um, if you're into tech, this is definitely the show to you know, keep signing up for. And today we're going to talk about something that you probably wouldn't think wouldn't come to mind when you think of tech, but book clubs. Um, not usually the, think of those two things together, but Amanda's going to explain it all to us today. So I'll just hand it over to you, Amanda. All right. So as I was kind of learning about new concepts in tech and I was introducing people to tech and kind of figuring it out for myself, books were kind of the main thing I went to. Um, when you go to any business ecosystem, innovation ecosystem, school learning system, there's, or, there's always a curated list of books. So if you're wanting to try to find out what the innovation system in your own community is, how change happens, how technology is introduced, books are the way to start. So what we're going to cover is kind of some guiding topics. As I read through all these different books and I started learning these new materials, I started pulling out some different recurring questions and recurring topics that come up. So these are the topics that are going to guide the discussion questions and guide the book selection. And then I'll dig into the actual book recommendations themselves. Each book will have some additional materials and we'll also go over an overall discussion guide. I've gotten to some specific book guide, book discussion guides for some of the books, but I haven't gotten to all of them yet. But really what's more helpful is the overall guide so you can tailor it and customize it to your community. Because you might have some better questions that work than I would be able to know because you're there, I'm not. Mm -hmm. And so then the last little section is going to be some activity recommendations. And so when you start introducing new tech, sometimes people want to try it. So these are the activity re recommendations and I have like a little resource hub that you can start going to to start pulling ideas from and start adapting things to what works for you. And I'll also mention while we're here at the beginning of your presentation that um, these slides will be available to everybody. Um, they're available right now, actually. We shared the link into the chat um, if you want to go look at them right now, but they'll also be linked there when the archive is put out as well, so you'll have access to all of these slides. And these do run through Google Slides, so there are embedded resources in there that you can grab from. All right, so these are some of our framing questions. So 
innovation has become, I'm the technology innovation librarian. No one can tell you what that means, but you have to kind of figure out what is the innovation you actually want to see in your community. Because you can read a whole mess of stuff, but it's not really going to make a huge difference unless you can actually pinpoint specific things you want to change. Mm -hmm. So you want to start pulling out what are the problems facing my community and say, well, I, we have a poverty crisis right now. We have a homelessness crisis. Um, we have people that are looking for jobs right now. And how can technology help this? because technology is only helpful if it's actually solving a problem. Otherwise, it's just kind of cool. And so there's kind of a, I also dug into the research and design and how technology comes into existence in the world and then shifts over to being part of it a practical application. And what I found out is that 95% of the technology that's researched and invented never actually sees the light of day. It never leaves a lab. It just kind of is awesome. <laughs> so you'll find out that there's like Gartner's hype cycle that says like, here's artificial intelligence. It's awesome. It's going to change the world. And then mm -hmm. a lot of it doesn't happen. Some of it Do does. we ever get to actually use it ourselves? That's the thing. Yeah. So, and there are actually a wide range of ways that we can use this stuff, but when we start with the technology tool itself and don't connect it with a problem, it just kind of is shiny. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of, I focus on practical applications and customizing. So then that leads to the question of what does this change actually mean specifically to you and your community? So that is one of our guiding questions is as you read, start asking yourself these over and over and over again to figure out what does this mean? Mm -hmm. And what are the what are the jobs that are coming out of technology? How is this going to apply to me? How is it going to apply to libraries? How is it going to apply to the industries that are within the organization? Which industries are going to change? And what is the job growth going to look like as this new tech starts to come into play? A lot of libraries are working with economic development groups and business groups and inter entrepreneurship groups. So this is going to help a lot in trying to figure out what that system is going to look like. And I put start global, live local on the bottom because a lot of these ideas are giant. They encompass the entire world. They're working at scale but the stuff we care about is usually right here. And a lot of the ideas and innovation cycles, they start local in someone's basement and then they can innovate outwards. Like, for example, WhatsApp, the guy who created that actually started out in a basement and now he's global. So we don't want to tell people that the everything they innovate, everything they innovate is going to go global, but it's possible. So the first thing I do, I recommend is something called designing reality. So designing reality is, it shakes things up a little bit. It's incredibly out of the box. It is far beyond what most people actually would want to do or have the access to the tools or resources to be able to do. And it talks about fab labs, kind of like the makerspaces of the future. And it talks about how you can actually do this stuff. So the authors of this book are actually three brothers. Um, Neil Gershenfeld works for MIT. He's the Center for Bits and Atoms. He is the one who started the Fab Labs in MIT. Um, okay. He builds, he has like a whole series of how to make almost anything and he can make almost anything. <laughs> and he also open sourced a lot of that so people can start using it. And they also in this, one of these links of what is a fab lab and how to start this is if you want maker spaces that are hyped up to the maximum capacity like if you are a beginner maker spacer this probably isn't the way to go for you but if you're already tied over to a university or if you're tied over to other organizations within your community then this is going to be awesome for you 
If you want to actually look at and assess different industries and start tying people over to CNC routers, 3D printers, and learn more about what fabrication is, because fabrication is the third digital revolution. It's how we're going to be reinventing the way things are made, how because things are working, running. Because <laughs> we can do it ourselves now a lot. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be kind of a, and this I'll actually open the discussion guide because this is kind of an example of how you can start opening up this conversation within your own community. Maybe you're not thinking about a fab lab right now, but you want to get like test the waters and find out, is this something we could ever do in the future? Maybe we're a small library, maybe we're bringing together small, like a bunch of small libraries and we want to find out what do we actually need and how are we going to connect problems and tech? So these are just some guiding questions to start thinking about what exactly is fabrication? Does it only matter to the world at large or do we actually see it locally? Are there any organizations that we we see every day, we use every day, and they use these tools in the background, but we're not in the organization, so we just don't know. And by reading these books, we uncover these connections and find out the organizations in our backyard, like manufacturing, auto manufacturing, bottling, um, soda manufacturing like the plant that's out in alliance like a lot of this stuff is they're using it and they can actually start using this technology to change their processes so that their businesses don't go under when they're trying to compete on a larger scale because a lot of organizations that they're competing with are using this stuff and maybe they're using it and you just don't know about it yet yeah And I've also put in a link to the TED talk that is from Joel, and he talks about, no, this one I think is actually from Neil, but he talks about unleashing creativity in the Fab Lab and how that ecosystem kind of works. So I chose those as kind of the library specific things. There's a whole mess of other stuff they've talked about, but mm -hmm. it's mostly for higher education and social science. Both mm -hmm. fascinating to me, but We'll stick with libraries. <laughs> Just to start, yeah. I think you, you mentioned that this book could be a bit much for some of our libraries just starting out, but I think it might be nice to like at least see how, it, how big it could get to dream just for fun, you know? It's um, good to have it as like an end goal to find out to like, I start with like capacity just to like shake things up and kind of open up new ideas. Because yeah. a lot of times people are closed off to any possibility of doing something giant, but when they start breaking it down piece by piece, it's that actually not that bad and it's kind of necessary. So it just started. Yeah, the discussion guide questions that you have there are very helpful too. Um, I know with all of our, you know, our usual book club kits that we do, we always try to include things like that as well. So you're not just kind of flailing around wondering, so we all read this book. What do you think? No, here's, yeah. let's talk about these particular things. Yeah. Yeah. And let me, I'm going to close this out, go back into the presentation. just to make it bigger. So the next one is create the future. So this is sort this is actually geared toward how people can change their own habits and mindsets and it's geared specifically toward businesses. So it's small businesses and local and it's basically businesses of all sizes. And this is starting to dig into the more practical application side of things. Because if you want to know how technology is creating new jobs and how this is going to be impacting the what businesses want from people and what businesses want from people in terms of generating innovation within organizations and within communities, this is one of the books that you actually need. So this and this actually comes with its own innovation handbook. So this is a guy that has done this and he's like been there, done this and pretty much every size company. And he started to look at the trends of how this actually works and kind of 
it asks people to look deeper into how they think about things and start expanding what they believe is possible for themselves and for the community. Because people get stuck into ruts. They start telling themselves that we can't do this. This is something that they do over there. It's not something that we can do over here. And this is starting to kind of change that mindset. And that's why I started attaching these topic categories to each one of these books because the growth mindset is something that comes up a lot. And this growth mindset is how you think about what you are capable of doing and how you think about how you are presenting yourself to the outside world. When you start encountering new topics and new ideas, do you say, this isn't for me? Or do you say, yeah, I could try that. And if you're one of those that say, I could try that, then you already have the growth mindset. If you encounter a new idea and every time you just say, nope, not doing it, then it's a closed mindset. So it's starting to ask yourself how you approach change, how you approach new ideas, new concepts, and how you can start to shift that ideas and mindset to start accepting some of that technology. And he also talks about how this extends over to actual businesses. So if you're going to have a business succeed, you need to have people who have that mindset. And they're going to start looking for that mindset when they're doing the hiring. And if you aren't part of your business community already, then you are trying to kind of incorporate the library into job skills, job creation, makerspace, technology exploration. If you are following the K through 12 scene and you're looking at the um, ISTE's um, innovation guide, this is what they're talking about, but just from the business side. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, if you want an innovative classroom, if you want an innovative mindset, you want an entrepreneurial mindset, you want a STEM and STEAM classroom, this is what it's leading to. This is what classrooms are trying to actually get people to do, is disrupt their thinking and be open to ideas. And so this keynote is kind of like a little, it's like a elevator speech version of what he talks about. He's been doing this for a millennia, so he's got like another collection of stuff. So you can also learn about his other podcast articles and the other stuff he's got available. So we just talked about the back here. We talked about the third digital revolution. That's about fabrication, how things are being made and how it's how technology is impacting that process. But we've also got the fourth industrial revolution. So this is going to be I know it's trippy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the fourth industrial revolution is about how technology is even further advancing um, how we interact with the world. So it's going to be the impact of artificial intelligence. It's going to be how brain computer interaction is working, um, which is trippy. You should read about it. <laughs> And it's going to be, so the best way that you can kind of introduce people to the idea of the fourth industrial revolution is to start with this video. This video actually came out of the World Economic Forum. This Klaus Schwab actually works for the World Economic Forum. And they're kind of one of the leading organizations that are talking about this. They're one of many, I mean, it's everywhere. But you're going to start seeing fourth industrial revolution in how supply chains work, how manufacturing works, how stuff gets shipped from one end of the country to the other, the technology that's helping to make that happen, um, how machine learning is being used to track trends and be able to reduce the cost of supply chains, and how they're being able to pull patterns out of data to be able to improve and streamline processes. So a lot of this stuff is invisible. Um, what, what happens inside of a computer chip, you can't see it, but computer chips are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and more effective and more efficient. And it's that kind of more, Moore's law that's saying that technology is moving quicker. So 
because technology as a tool is getting better, the rate of change that's happening out in the real world and the rate of change that's happening in organizations is going faster. So yes, technology did always change the way things that, the way we do things at all times, mm. but now it's happening at light speed. And that's why people- Exponentially getting faster and faster, yep. And so there's also this interview that I put in here with Klaus Schwab that talks about the industrial revolution. So if people are a little bit iffy about, is this gonna be the book for me? Is this something that we actually need to talk about? Start here and ask people if they're freaked out about it. And if they're freaked out about it, they usually wanna talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of one of the main questions about that, like the guiding questions about this is, how do you feel about all this happening? Is your community, you can't actually stop innovation and stop technology. Because even if your community rejects this technology, the community next door is already doing it. And that's how Toyota actually got to be the way they are. Toyota embraced all the technology first and they started the lean engine, like the lean impact process. They started, they are actually pioneered that whole thing. They were, well, they were one of the pioneers. And they started looking at different ways that they can test out different ideas and start to implement and implement new ideas, test them and change more quickly within an organization. And so they did it quickly, but then Ford took about 30 years to run through the change process. And the like the change process through Ford was actually guided by one of the brothers who wrote this book. And he was talking about this in designing reality is how long it took Ford to actually make that change and now they aren't as competitive anymore. So they're still a brand name, but they are they, the underlying processes, the organizational structure, it's not the same. So they just aren't viewed the same way that they once were. So that's kind of how this starts to all tie together, is that once you start reading these innovation books, they all kind of start to overlap. Oh yeah. Yeah. And just starting these conversations about what is this technology going to mean in our community? What happens if we ignore this stuff? What's going on in the or in the related organizations, manufacturing, um, auto manufacturing, supply chains, distribution? What's local that we should actually be caring about? And what are the problems with the unmet needs that could actually be solved by this technology we didn't know about? So this fourth industrial revolution is actually part of a two pack. He later wrote the shaping the future of the fourth industrial revolution because apparently he really, really likes this topic. <laughs> and he digs deeper into what we can actually do about it. So they're both worth a read. And if you wanna do a book club and you have to choose just one, I'd probably start with the first one, just so people know what in the world he's talking about. And then you can do like a later one if people are interested in it. So now the thing that most people care about is what do jobs look like? So, okay, great. These are mostly for the entrepreneurs and innovators that are going to be creating these jobs. But what about the people that are going to be working in the jobs? And these are the people that most libraries are helping. They're the ones who are trying to help people figure out how do I write my application? How do I write my resume? How do I get these jobs? And how do I choose a job that's not going to be automated in the future? So yeah. this new geography of jobs is talking about, okay, so what are the trends right now? Where, how are jobs actually being created? When artificial intelligence, machine learning gets introduced into an organization, there's a whole slew of different roles that are created and adapted based on the introduction of that technology. So for example, when you have to build a machine learning team, there's always going to be a project manager that's going to be kind of organizing the departments that need to be discussing this problem. That project manager needs to have a really deep understanding of how that technology works. Otherwise, quiet chaos. And then, so that's kind of why even people who are not inside technology 
they also need to know the basics of how that tool works. And then you have data analysts who are going to be collecting, like scraping and collecting and analyzing the data that's going to be fed into a machine learning model. Sometimes these data analysts work within the organization, sometimes they're consulted outside and then brought in just for like a small little portion of the segment. And then you also need, so machine learning is only helpful when it's embedded into like a separate system. Most machine learning is embedded into a website. It turns up like a little dashboard or a chat bot. It's something that is visually appealing that someone can see, or it's in like a little, like the echo dot that you can actually talk to and interact with. So if you are using some of that outside technology, then you need someone who really understands how to use the Echo Dot, how to program the Echo Dot, and how to program, or how to program websites or software to use this technology. Sometimes it's in, in consultation with an outside organization, but if you use it a ton, they're probably gonna hire someone like inside the organization. To keep and then up you with it regularly, yeah. And you need a business analyst. So a business analyst is going to be looking at the needs of the organization, the needs across different departments, and making sure that the product that is being designed is actually meeting those needs. So they're also communicating with that project manager who is working through the different tasks that need to be done. So it's kind of really good streamlined communication that runs through all of this. So that's why even if you don't do the technology training, if you teach communication, project management tools, and introduce the concept of what all this stuff is, then you can start routing people over to organizations that can help with career exploration and training in those different organizations. But the only reason that you would actually need to learn this stuff is if there was enough organizations within your community that needed it. And if you have people that are interested in this technology, but you don't have a purpose for the technology in your community, that's when people leave. And that's why you start seeing people who are interested in STEM leaving certain communities and flocking toward others. And you have like little magnet communities that are starting to draw these people out while your community is saying, why don't you stay here? We have a coffee shop and it's just, <laughs> And but that's part of it is because it's not visible how this technology is being used. And if you want to be able to train people in STEM and STEAM and all these different cool things, which is what schools are, are really focusing and zeroing in on right now, and libraries are zeroing in on STEM and STEAM, but then after a certain point, you cap out. And it's because where's the practical application? We just got kids sort of interested in building websites and we got them interested in building a circuit. Where is it used? So this is the new geography of jobs. That's part of that. It's so shiny. Let's check it out. Okay, now what? And spoiler alert. Have, now what? Yeah. <laughs> So this one is kind of like a, this book is like an overview of everything. And you can start doing book group discussions even with local businesses. And you can start doing them with people who are actually looking for jobs to start encouraging them to widen their, like widen their purview, like widen the scope of what they're looking at. Because their interests right now, if they're interested in art, they might be able to build graphics for a website or build a video to kind of spice up how people do their training within different organizations. And you can start looking at improving the way things are being done. And so this is how innovation works. I mean, the entire education system was actually changed by a psychologist who visited his kid's classroom and saw that there was a need for this little box so that people would be able to learn and practice skills differently and be able to do the testing process differently. So education was changed by a visiting psychologist who was interested in how his kid learned. So innovation happens pretty much everywhere. And you don't actually have to always be inside the actual field to be able to find something that can change. 
and most innovation happens when two completely different ideas come together. Look outside like, your own box. Yeah. yeah. Like technology and book groups. <laughs> <laughs> and so these are kind of the some of the little introductory videos that you can use to start getting people introduced to this idea and what it's actually going to be all about. You can put these in your marketing or you can put these in um, like a little social media blurb that just says, here's what you're getting into and just add some little guiding questions that say, what are you going to do in the future? So this one is kind of similar to, it also talks about the future of work, but this one is actually kind of cool because it digs into the Midwest. So it digs into, it actually is pretty local. I mean, it talks about things that you're actually going to see every day and you're going to see it, like these are going to be recognizable jobs that didn't come out of Silicon Valley. <laughs> and these are going to be, it's more of a practical look at what people can actually do from different starting points. Like these books over here are like the really high, like the high end people who are, who have been like studying for years and a day to find out what all this stuff is. And there are a lot of people like that in the Midwest, they're doing it, but there's also a lot of people that are just they just want to pay the bills. So it kind of goes both ways. So this is going to talk about what people need to do to actually change their habits, find out, like be able to adapt to how technology is changing these jobs. Because sometimes it's not going to be the employees that are going to be changing the jobs, it's going to be the managers. The managers don't always talk to the employees about how that change is going to look. So it's just going to be this change happened, and what are you gonna do about it? That's one of the things that they actually talk about in creating the future, is how you can start working with employees to make change instead of inflicting change on employees. And apparently that's a big thing in the business world. So it's kind of, how are you going to make change happen and as an employee, how are you going to learn how to adapt to the constant change that's going to happen as technology is introduced to your job? Because maybe you went for an interview for a job. They didn't talk about technology. They don't always talk about the exact tools that they use. They don't talk about the path that your career is going to take. They don't like, what do you actually talk about in an interview when you start a job? It's you. It's usually not the specific technology tools. Unless so you that's might, your job really, really, you know, focuses on that. But yeah, mm -hmm. mostly it's it's more higher level, big picture. Yeah. Yeah. But once you're in the job and you, you're able to actually see the inner workings and how the system actually works, you understand the specific problems that are being faced within the organization. And as you read about this new technology, employees or people at all different levels of the organization can start to see how a technology tool could actually change things, how it could improve processes. Maybe a manager doesn't hear about these tools, but maybe the employee does. And then they go to the manager and say, hey, can we start using data science? I think we can start pulling out some different patterns and make better decisions based on what we do. And then what they what the employee needs to learn even before they start making that introduction is how can I communicate this idea? The best way to communicate an idea might be a video. It might be a brief video that just says, this is what I'm doing. But if you're not comfortable with videography equipment, then you're not going to be comfortable communicating your idea because you first need to distill that idea, but then you need to learn the videography tools. So the library can actually help with providing access to software and providing access to tools and say, here, you don't need to worry about like the extra step of learning videography. Here's a little workshop. Here's the access to the like free access to the software. Now you can make your video and then go make your case to the manager saying, hey, we need data, like data science or hey, we need a new website or hey, we need a new 
insert cool technology here. I mean, because that you need technology to be able to convey the idea that you need technology. And it's kind of, it's circular, but it's true. It's 22, there it is. <laughs> yeah. And it could even just be as simple as learning how to use Google Slides or getting access to PowerPoint to be able to make a presentation, because not everyone has that. So it's how do you assess problems? How do you assess ideas? And how do you communicate these, these ideas? And how do you assess the way things are going to be changing within an organization? Because some organizations are closed to new ideas. Some of them are already open to it. And you just have to find out which organization you're in and what you can do about it. So now this is another one of those start with a giant, 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 giant idea and then figure out what you can do practically. So this dude, I think I first heard about him in an interview that he did with Elon Musk. And they were talking about this insane competition that I was never, ever, ever going to recommend that anyone try to do because <laughs> I think it was like a recommendation or an innovation for space ideas and space exploration, wow. which is cool. It's uh -huh. awesome. But in this book, which is actually part of a series, it opens up... <laughs> It opens your mind to bigger ideas so that you can think bigger than you did before. So a lot of this is focusing on incremental change. Start opening up to the massive giant ideas, then you'll be more opening open to looking at the smaller ideas that are right around you. And it starts to make this the world of technology look more urgent because most people don't think about it. And most people, it's not on the radar of most people unless they're already in that world. But once they start looking at it and start looking at the trends and start understanding how this stuff is working, then this is actually a blueprint for how to make big change. Because we need big change. You want to end poverty? You need big change. And it's going to be that this is how to do it. And he focuses on how to make the world better using change instead of just how to make money. I'm sure he's awesome at making money. I don't even want to know how much he makes. <laughs> well, these are all the New York Times bestsellers. You can see that right there. Yeah. And so this talks about more practical applications of how business technology industries, and it also works in nonprofits too. It's just problem solving. So if you want to start helping people understand specific technology tools, then you can start with things like AIQ. So AIQ digs specifically into artificial intelligence and all the related technologies like big data, data science, analyzing data, what does it mean, what are you going to do with it, how can we not make robots take over the world, or how can we make robots do some good in the world. And he goes, he digs into about a million and one examples of how artificial intelligence is doing cool stuff. And if you ever want a really easy explanation of what AI actually is and how it works, this artificial intelligence and in breakfast tacos is a really awesome video to put out. I would actually recommend putting out this video alongside this book, just so it's kind of an easier soft introduction to what AI is. They go into somewhat technical terms, but it's also clearly relatable and uses a lot of stories and anecdotes. It's an incredibly story-driven book, which makes it awesome for libraries. So you can start talking about what does AI actually mean to us? What are we going to do with it? How is it going to change the community? How is it going to impact me specifically, our organization? What are we going to do with it? And if you want to understand some of the major forces in technology that actually are making this change, um, Kevin Kelly, uh, he wrote this book about the 12 forces that are shaping the future. Though I thought the index of this book was really weird because it actually doesn't describe technology at all. It talks about like sensing and communicating and uses like a whole bunch of random terms that I wouldn't have associated with technology. But once I actually started reading the book, 
it made sense. So mm -hmm. if you do open this book, ignore that table of contents and just start reading it and it'll Trust come them. together. And they also talk about the, so a lot of the technology books that I chose, it focuses on basically how to make the world better. I can also point you to about 40 million and one books that say we're all gonna die, but. <laughs> technology <laughs> but is evil and horrible and yeah. Yeah. Gonna kill us all, sure. Yeah. So I, those books, I, they're, I'm sure they're helpful in some way, shape, or form, but if they are alarmist or if they are saying that the world's going to end, we should just go live in a cave now, I avoided those. They're, they exist, but I avoided those and focused on how can we steer this conversation to how can we use technology to do some good and mm -hmm. how can we shape a better world using these tools. And this is a lot of what he talks about. And a really good introduction to this is the interview that he did with SXSW, which I never say right if I try to say it quick. And <laughs> it's just like Stop a little, <laughs> you know, it's just a little brief overview of what it's all about. And he goes into a little blurb about how it all works together. Read the book, it puts the pieces together. Mm -hmm. This is a similar one that digs into specific examples of how technology is used in practice in businesses. And this is going to be, again, what both entrepreneurs and what employees who want to introduce innovation will want to know. Bernard Marr is a name that you will actually come across quite often. He's kind of a leading technologist and leading somewhat futurist trend tracking for how technology is changing the world. You'll see him a lot in virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. Uh, he digs into the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence. And I pointed you to his website here, and I'll actually click it open because he has a collection of articles that are organized by topic. And it is organized based on technology tool and when you start digging into the, it'll tell you what all this stuff is, and then it'll dig into examples of how this is practically being used out in the world. So you can also use these to adapt lesson plans, adapt activity ideas, and start inserting real applications into how people are learning this stuff. So that's why I sent you straight over to this one because it has the collection, like the biggest collection of practical business applications and practical industry applications that I could find outside of like MIT or Stanford or something like that. Mm -hmm. But let me close this one. It's just kind of a cool one to look at. Yeah. So Disrupt You is, I can't say that I love the title of it. It sounds like a self-help book, but <laughs> it does yeah uh, but it it is what it is like so i ignored the little title under it because i had read some of the reviews and it was actually recommended to me by a business community so mm -hmm. i read it and then i was like i really wish they hadn't branded it like that because it's actually so much better than the self-help book cover book than it actually looks like and it actually talks about how you can start looking at your own mental processes and start saying like, like disrupting those little negative thoughts inside that say, you can never do this, you're never going to do this. And it starts saying, look at the bigger picture and start just trying it. Now that I say it out loud, it's a self-help book. It is a <laughs> self-help book, <laughs> but, but it's also, it's a program. Yeah, look yeah. it's not cheesy it's not it's more of like a realistic this is what the world looks like and this is how you can interact better in the world to make things suck less that's just like it's and all changes is really changing habits it's kind of recognizing what you want to change about yourself and what your goal is and being able to set that finite definite goal so you know 
you know that the changes you're making are going to actually get you where you want to go. And it's, but a it's related for, to yeah. what we've been talking about, the innovation and the future of work and technology too. So it's not, it's a self-help book, but with a different kind of focus maybe than other ones. Yeah. It's I'm not writing a real yeah. self-help book, so I wouldn't know, but. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, ignore the title, just give it a try. Mm -hmm. And so this one will also, this TED talk is also an intro to how he actually ties this into business, jobs, careers. And it's not just for business leaders. He is a business leader, but it's also for employees at all levels. It's for students, career seekers, career changers, pretty much if you are looking for a job and if you want to be able to be an innovator within that job, then this is going to be a good book to start with. And he also talks about the trends and kind of the direction of how businesses are going. He knows a lot about tech. He's just, he's one of those just do it kind of people. And so if you are looking to make your community into a startup community, if you need to create new jobs, if you need innovation within your community, this is that startup ecosystem book. So this is even just kind of getting people to, together to talk about this idea. Um, Omaha Lincoln is actually trying to start a startup community ecosystem, an innovation ecosystem. And this is actually a book that I've been recommending to that ecosystem to start looking at how does all this stuff fit together? A lot of times there are really isolated mini ecosystems across communities, like the education ecosystem will band together, and then the business ecosystem will band together, and the nonprofit ecosystem bands together. Nonprofits don't talk to businesses, and then education, they're doing their thing and it's kind of they don't always talk together but they and should so, yeah <laughs> but and this is just talking about how are you going to get um how are you going to drive like write and change policies so that you're actually helping innovation instead of hurting it how are you going to be how is the community going to deal with new technology and deal with change and deal with privacy security policies as this new tech gets introduced? Or are you just going to try it and then wait for the chaos? And <laughs> so it's kind of like these people, like um, Brad Feld has been doing this forever and a day. He's a venture capitalist. He's worked with businesses. He started businesses. He's been working in this ecosystem. If you watch the myths of a startup community and building great startup communities, these are both interviews with Brad Feld, and he just talks a lot about this, how the book came about, and how he had to go through about a million and one iterations of this before he found what works. I'm sure he's still doing it. But this is just to open up a conversation about how do people feel about innovation in startups and introducing new companies that are that might be a little bit different than what you're used to and if you were to track how one person who's trying to make innovation and trying to make a start a business how do they navigate their resources and how do they figure out what to do if, is that process really hard for people or is it easier do they have a path forward or do they have to like climb 8 million mountains to be able to get to where they want to go? And it starts looking at how are people, what are people's experiences with actually trying to do this stuff and how can you make it better? And this is actually another part of a two pack. Um, he wrote the second one with Ian Hathaway and they are talking about once you have an innovation ecosystem, how can you start evolving it, making it better, and start to iron out the processes so that people aren't banging their foreheads against a wall trying to do it as much? And this is specifically about education. Um, this is actually one that I came across in, like oddly enough, the most questions that I get about all this stuff are from higher ed. 
I mean, I'm assuming that they must just be thinking about it more. So I tossed this in just in case you happen to be interacting with or from that field. But this is one of the best books that I've read about the future of technology, the future of education, higher education, how community colleges and universities are both adapting and changing, building new apprenticeship models and internship models and veering away from the um, four-year bachelor cycle to be able to adapt to the faster learning cycle that's necessary for faster growth in learning technology, skill building, career changing, career building, the chaos of figuring out how to adapt to automation technology, all that jazz. So, and this one was actually from a course that I took through MIT online and they talk about shaping the future of work. And this was actually a recommended book from that class. Oh. And so now we kind of veer, I'll just go over into, I did promise in the description of this that I would veer into some recommendation for kids. You will find just by the layout of the slides, this is not my comfort zone, but I did ask um, other people and consult other organizations to find out what actually works best. Uh, the first thing that was recommended to me was the Curie Society because MIT Press is breaking into STEM theme graphic fiction. They also have a whole slew of um, educator resources and tools. They're a bigger organization, so they have more freedom to research and build that out. That's why I recommend them first, just because, well, they got it. And oops, there it is. So I've also compiled this list of um, book lists for kids that are from reputable organizations. Um, you can easily grapple like Google best STEM book lists for kids, but instead of going that approach, I focused on specific organizations that have recurring lists where they do kind of a moderated panel. They huh. gather submissions sort of like the Library Commission does to suss out the best books that are within that category. And these are the organizations that have kind of recurring lists that actually moderate and curate them instead of just some random group that Googled it and put together a best books and list, which is, I mean, it's everywhere. Google it, you'll find it. Oh, sure, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but having these from more of like the experts is, is very, yeah, the way to go. And this one is more of a local resource that I just found out about recently. It's the 4-H STEM Reading Connections Program. So if you are within Nebraska or within the area, then I would actually reach out to them to learn more about how this works and how you can start implementing it. All right, so next on the list is, we have, first I'll ask, are there any questions that people actually had before yeah, I dig into them? I don't think anybody typed anything in yet, but let's see here. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions um, about any of the books or any of the topics that Amanda has been uh, mentioning, uh, type into your questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, or if you have any ideas, um, I'm sure Amanda would love to hear. Uh, if you have any titles, any books you've read on technology or technology and society or any of that that you might recommend to people, go ahead and type in. Um, but no, nothing came in while you were talking, um, but I will keep an eye on it and um, mention it. Um, I will mention we're getting close to 11 o'clock, but um, we don't get cut off right at the top of the hour. So uh, we'll go as long as it takes um, any of your questions or comments you guys have to get through any, all of them. And for Amanda to get through everything in her presentation that she wants to talk about. Um, if you do have to leave because you know, um, you only a lot of the hour, that's fine. We're recording the show. You'll be able to watch the whole recording later um, at your convenience. And so I just have two other quick things to go through. That is your wraparound activity ideas and related activities. And I'll go over these guiding discussion, this framework. So as I mentioned, I haven't yet had time to flush out the entire guided discussion for every single book. I focused more on the uh, videos, articles, resources for right now, because across all of these different books, you basically have the same goals. So the goal is to figure out, 
how your community is going to interact and engage with this technology. Technology is only helpful if it's actually solving a relevant problem that people care about. So when you're guiding these discussions, try to uncover and link this technology to a specific problem that's within, within the community. Um, one of, some of the biggest ones are how they're actually business related or they are organizational related. And some of them are nonprofit related because they are working on social issues and kind of how to make the world suck less. And so a lot of the examples in the books, they say, uh, right now we're focusing on, there's a homelessness issue right now. People have to move from location to location a lot. When they move from location to location, they lose their ID. When they lose their ID, they can't get into a shelter and they can't get into a, uh, they can't get a job because they need their paperwork. So mm -hmm. there are cities like Detroit and other places that have been using blockchain to gather and digitize all the um, social security card numbers and like the vital record information from homeless populations that shift from place to place so that they can be able to direct employers to that database instead of just accept they lost their stuff. And so this has been, this is kind of one of those ways that technology is helping to solve those problems that matter. And you can start saying, well, this is a tool. We're interested in learning about this tool. How can we actually start implementing this within our own community? What are the next steps that we would actually need to take? Who are the organizations within the community that we would need to consult? And how can we make this happen? So I'm gonna jump into These resources, um, if you've gone to a session before, you've probably seen these already, but mm -hmm. I'm going to jump into, I'll do this one. So if you are trying to find out how you can actually implement this technology and trying to find out next steps, you can go to a technology category, go into how it's made, and these how it's made resources are going to dig into the teams that are necessary to actually create this technology. And it also goes into the steps of designing and implementing that technology and how to implement this within a business or within an organization, how to build the team and how to actually make this stuff happen. And then there are a lot of them have career paths and resources for if you aren't going to be the one doing the implementation, how can you be part of the team that does it? So understanding how this stuff is made goes a long way towards understanding the jobs that need to be created or the jobs that have been created to make this stuff happen. And if you want to be able to kind of do a extreme introduction into how this stuff works, maybe people aren't really ready to use it, but they wanna understand how, like what it is and what they're looking at, the Try It in the Library section has a collection of, it's basically a collection of activities. And these are put together so that you can either facilitate an activity or you can provide access to this link if you have library staff that might not be comfortable doing it themselves, but they wanna be able to point people in the direction of how to do it then, like how to experiment with it. Um, these, I haven't yet separated this out into beginner, intermediate, and advanced, but I should probably do that. I don't know when, but I should probably do that. And if people want to learn from the experts, there's also learning communities that people can go to to basically go for advanced information or to be able to get more information and resources from them. So if you want to actually talk to a human, about how the, you can actually do this stuff. A lot of times you actually consult places like IBM or Tensor or Kegelflow or Kegelflow or these organizations that actually make this stuff or train the people that make this stuff. And they will have the answers or be able to, you might even just be able to outsource it and say, we want to do this. Can you do this? Nine times out of 10, they actually probably already have solved that problem elsewhere and they might actually already have something to give you. So it's worth an ask. So if you wanna dig into any of this technology, you can go into 
If you don't already have this link, I will put it into the chat now. Chat and here. And I will just call it high tech resources. And there we go. So it is 11.03. I almost made it within my time, but I will. you have these slides in case you want to dig deeper into these guiding questions. A lot of them you can just read and you'll kind of get the general idea. But that is about all I've got for you. And I will hang tight in case there are any questions. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Amanda. This is some some good ideas for I know a lot of libraries do book clubs um, have a regular thing. We have our book club kits here at the Library Commission. Um, and I think some of my I know we have some that do a mixture of fiction and nonfiction in their groups and some that actually focus on um, a nonfiction book club. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure this will get a lot of ideas for people for um, titles that they might want to uh, start uh, bringing into their uh, calendar of events when they're figuring out what are we going to talk about next time. Yeah. yeah. Um, anybody have any questions, anybody thoughts or uh, books that you've read or if any of you have read any of these? And I know I haven't, um, but uh, And if you yeah. want an innovation, yeah, but yeah, you will have the links to everything, so you can be able to go in and explore these. Yeah. Um, just double checking. Okay, cool. Want to miss anything that comes in? <laughs> The areas. All right. Um, so thank you, Amanda. This is great. I think we have some lots of interesting discussions hopefully happening around with people in their in their uh, book club groups or uh, ooh, a new cool idea might be to start up a techie book club group. Yeah. If you know have people that are very much interested in this topic, I'm sure everybody in the libraries is certainly a little are always asking what about the new thing or when are we going to learn about robots or uh, <laughs> what about this, you know, how evil technology is and um, you could possibly have a book club group that specifically focuses on this, this kind of area. Yeah, technology is what you make it, so make it good. Exactly, and you can, yeah. All right, I am going to pull presenter control back to my screen. There, go. there it is to wrap things up. Doesn't look like anybody has any questions. That's great. You guys all know where to find Amanda if you do um, want to ask her about anything. Um, so uh, this show is being recorded and will be available on our uh, Encompass Live website. Um, we will have a link to the slides. I've got the link right over here already. So um, this will be added to the session page here. There'll be a link to slides and a link to the recording. I'll show you here on our Encompass Live website. These are our upcoming shows and right underneath them is a link to our archives. The most recent ones go at the top of the page. And um, the one for last week, we only had a recording. We didn't, they didn't do slides, they used the website, but there'll be two links on today's that will be one to the recording and one to the slides. It'll be right here at the top of the list. Uh, when the recording is ready, I will email everyone who registered for today's show and attended today's show to let you know it's here and ready to watch. Uh, should, <coughs> excuse me, should be by the end of the day tomorrow at the latest, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. I'll let you all know. Um, we also push it out to all of our social media. We do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. You'll see it linked on all of our different Encompass Live web pages. If you like to use Facebook, um, give us a like over there and you'll get notifications about what we do. We also push out onto um, Twitter and Instagram. I think they've so far. Uh, we have a hashtag for the show, Encump Live, little abbreviation of our show name. So um, you can look for us there as well. But we push out onto, onto there and onto um, here. Um, here's a reminder to come into today's show, uh, talk about our presenters, recordings when they're available, anything else that we think is up, might be of interest if people are interested in the show. So if you want to, give us a like on Facebook or watch for our hashtag from, coming from me and the Library Commission's uh, other social media channels. 
Here on our archives, I will show you there is a search feature here. We can search our, our show archives for a particular topic if you want to. Uh, we have a, you can search the full archives and we, or you can search this most recent 12 months if you want something really recent. And I mentioned that because if this is the full archives for our show going back to the very beginning, Encompass Live premiered in January 2009. So there is over 10, what, 12 years worth of recordings here, and they're all here. So just pay attention when you are, if you do search the full archive and watch an old show, just pay attention, attention to the original um, broadcast date. Um, some of our shows will stand the test of time and still be good, valid, useful info, but some things will become old or outdated, information may um, change, uh, links may break, uh, Resources and services may change drastically over the 10 years time. So just pay attention to when you what um, when it was originally broadcast um, to know when that information was presented. Um, but, but we will, you know, we're librarians. This is what we do. We gather historical info and keep it um, available for people. So as long as we have a place to host it, right now everything's up there on our YouTube channel. We will always have it all available there. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's show. Next week, we're going to be talking about grants. Um, Nebraska Library Commission grants coming up for 2022, we say it's 2021, 2022. Um, we, myself, Sally Snyder and Holly Duggan, who are all from our library development team, will be talking about the grants that we're going to be offering this year. The Library Commission offers four grants annually some of them some of them not every year and we're offering all four of them this year library improvement grants youth grants for excellence internship and ce and training grants um, a few changes to these grants coming this year um, due to the funding sources we are using some of the american rescue plan act monies arpa for library improvement and youth grants some of theirs some of their restrictions their rules um, and requirements are going to be are changed um, change for the better but uh, Take a look and sign up for that next week if you are a Nebraska library looking for funding for any programs or projects you might want to do. Um, we'll be talking about all of our upcoming grants. Um, this is our upcoming shows here too. Uh, I've got a few more dates to fill in in September and October, so keep an eye on that. Um, and notice we have our one week of the month of the year that we do not have an Encompass Live is when we have our state annual uh, um, Nebraska Library Association Conference. So October 13th, we will not be having a show. Um, sign up. Um, register for the conference instead you'll notice they have a mixture of in-person and virtual options so if you are not um, willing to or not comfortable going in person they are going to have virtual days as well so other than that that wraps it up for today thank you everybody for being here this morning with us thank you amanda this is great we'll see you in another month um, the end of September. Do you have any idea of what you might be talking about next time? We're still thinking about it. <laughs> Didn't want to put you on the spot, sorry. <laughs> the month I have away. a couple ideas. I got a library automation question Ooh, and okay. I got um, mostly automated lights. And um, I'm getting a lot more auditorium and redesign questions. Mm. What is the tech that we need for my auditorium? How can or we the meeting room with all the auditorium, technology. smart meeting room? And that's a, that's a good actually topic considering our grants that are coming up can, could be used to purchase some of that equipment. If yeah. people need to upgrade things in a meeting room or something in their library, yeah. All right, so keep your eyes open on our schedule. Everybody see what um, Amanda picks for her next topic. Other than that, thank you everybody for being here this morning. Hopefully we'll see you on a, a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>